One of the other major concerns about trust, of course, is the impact that technology has had on our news and information ecosystem. And Joanne is a member of the commission. This was discussed um, um, a great deal in both the journalism working group and the technology working group. And the technology um, group made several recommendations, including uh, recommending that, uh, that our data that the technology companies that are harvesting all of our private personal um, data, um, that they be information fiduciaries. In the same way, your, your accountant um, plays that role um, in your management of your finances. And also that there needs to be uh, not just political advertising, but all advertising. There needs to be transparency about who is paying to serve you um, information in your newsfeed. And finally, the really important role that technology companies need to play in terms of battling the spread of misinformation and disinformation. And Joanne, this was um, an issue that you came back to again and again on the commission about how important it was for journalists and for technology companies to take on this problem. Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, I actually think it is perhaps the, one of the, the most, if not the most significant recommendations that crosses over between the journalism and the technology areas. And just to give you guys a little bit of a peek um, into the commission deliberations, um, you're seeing the journalists who are all in violent agreement with one another. Um, we also had academics, lawyers, attorneys, and technologists. We had people from Google and Facebook and elsewhere on the commission, and boy, did we have some spirited discussions. Um, uh, but a lot of it is because, if you think about it, uh, media and the technology companies, particularly the big guys, Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, we really are frenemies. And on the one hand, uh, we have tension over financial models, over business, because you know, the vast majority, 80% of new advertising dollars, go to them instead of to us, which is one of the reasons we are all in financial straits. But another and very, very significant issue for our future is this misinformation and disinformation. And you know, it's really important to understand the role of the technology firms in allowing that to spread. And that, of course, erodes trust. So for example, um, you know, one of the things that we learned was uh, there's a lot of research being done on, on how mis- and disinformation spreads. And it turns out that uh, false information spreads actually much more quickly. I believe it's twice as quickly as true information. Um, and in addition to that, there's been research into what is the emotion that spreads most virally. And you might think that it's joy and puppies and babies, but it's not. It's anger. And so therefore, you think about the technology uh, firms and the platforms, what, and, and what is their business model? Their business model is they want information to be viral. That is actually how they make money. Um, what, it, what kind of information is viral? The most viral information, it turns out, is this sort of you know, false information that inflames anger and division. And so we really had some very difficult conversations about this, and it is the onus on the technology firms as well as on the journalists to work together, to come together in a way that we have not before in order to combat that spread. It is really one of the um, primary reasons, I mean, we talk about bias, um, but really one of the, the most dangerous uh, issues that is that facing our democracy today is this spread of mis- and disinformation. And I do think it's, it, it was quite a victory, and I give so much credit to our colleagues on the technology side. If you look at those recommendations, they are pledging to, um, to, to use innovation, uh, to employ innovation in order to try and figure out ways to stop the spread, the sharing of misinformation, and to stop the misinformation from appearing on their platforms. And so I, I do think that if we can carry through with that recommendation, we will go a long way uh, toward uh, restoring and repairing trust. 
Thank you. No, absolutely. And um, Knight Foundation is looking to uh, fund and support. There's an effort underway uh, led by my colleague Sam uh, Gill to support research to better understand how how we can make sure that we don't have a news and information ecosystem that's flooded with um, misinformation dis in, and disinformation. Now, myself, when we look at the journalism um, working group's uh, recommendations, there were also uh, some really great ideas that came out of it um, to help improve the flow of more and increase in accurate information, especially at the local level. And everyone will get a chance at the next panel uh, to hear from John Thornton, who is a co-founder of the American Journalism Project, which was formally um, announced and launched uh, yesterday with $42 million um, in support that has been raised uh, in the last six months. And the American Journalism uh, Project is a philanthropic venture capital fund that is designed to address the big problem that we have in so many local communities, and that is a lack of capital to support great civic public uh, service mission-driven um, journalism. And um, in addition to providing that capital, the American Journalism Project will do what every good VC firm does, and that's to make sure that the not-for-profit organizations that they will be investing in have the strategic guidance, the business expertise, and the technology expertise to help um, make sure that journalism, which as Joanne um, said, the business model for journalism has been uh, dis dismantled in the last uh, 15 years, or, or actually I think some would say it started before that, um, is, a, is a really great uh, path and promise for a whole new future on building a future for local news. And myself, maybe you could share with the audience some of the other ideas that uh, the commission recommended. Like oh. Before I get to the other ideas, I, I do want to paint you a picture um, about the kind of the kind of situation that these recommendations are uh, really designed to uh, address. I had a conversation at breakfast uh, with uh, my friend Bob Moore. Uh, Bob's a former editor of the El Paso Times and who now uh, is uh, uh, in deeply engaged uh, as a, a freelancer in coverage of issues surrounding uh, the border and the wall and you know, US immigration policy, family separation, all of those issues that are really at the forefront of uh, the, the national debate, but they're unfolding in a local community. Uh, and I want to, I want you to, I want you to picture uh, uh, El Paso as a community. Uh, and and Bob said something to me this morning that was uh, that was quite surprising. He said every journalist in El Paso is supported by advertising. And I want you to think about that for a second. Every journalist in that community is supported by advertising. Well, who, uh, what entities, um, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, or are, are, are Joanne mentioned, are getting 80% you know, of all new uh, advertising revenue? Well, they're the large-scale digital platforms. Uh, and so that, um, that, the, that, those resources are being taken out of local communities uh, and are, are, going, are, are going to the platforms. Uh, and, and not only, uh, and if wants to think about this too, El Paso is not a small community, but it also has zero public media. Hmm. Zero public media in El Paso, Texas. Uh, and so when we talk about new ways of capital formation, how do we create a, a new path to sustain local journalism, I would say a community like El Paso is, it would be ground zero for how do we create a new form uh, of media and a new, uh, a new way of, of financing uh, local journalism. But on, along with our other I ideas, you know, we, we have talked a great deal about partnerships and, and particularly uh, partnerships that take, say, national uh, entities uh, such as Frontline, uh, run by, with executive produced by uh, Commissioner Rainey Aronson, uh, and 
uh, and then pair uh, journalists at frontline with local journalists around the country. And then figuring out ways that uh, through that collaboration, we can put more resources back into, uh, back into local communities. You know, in the for-profit world, uh, the USA Today Network, which uh, I'm a part of and, uh, and Joanne was a, a part of until last year, uh, the whole idea is how do we leverage local by pairing local journalists with those uh, working on, on the national level. Uh, other ideas that we talked about, uh, I mentioned uh, City Bureau in Chicago. This is a, uh, a nonprofit that brings people from local neighborhoods to actually cover uh, stories uh, in their communities, in their neighborhoods. Uh, on, uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we've talked about Report for America and, uh, and, and similar models that, again, put resources back um, into, uh, into local communities. We are literally at a point where, um, you know, my, my company now is uh, being um, the targeted by a hostile takeover uh, effort by uh, a private equity firm. And you know, there's a real tension between uh, those uh, who lead news companies and care about journalism uh, and those who lead news companies uh, and would employ uh, what is uh, referred to uh, in, uh, in the uh, financial world as a harvest strategy. You know, you're just you know, you know, going to harvest as much as you can from the assets uh, and, then, uh, and then either sell them or, or shut them down. Uh, and, and, and I don't think any of us want that to happen uh, when it comes to journalism entities. And so that's why new models of capital formation, we talked about public benefit corporations, uh, such as the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, which is now part of the Lenfest Institute, uh, and making uh, shareholder value part of the equation, but not the end-all, be-all of, uh, of the business enterprise. And that's, uh, that's where public benefit corporations come in. Uh, another potential model that we talked about uh, takes, an, as its example, community development corporations. Community development corporations are formed in uh, a lot of local communities around the country to uh, handle issues such as job training uh, and education in underserved communities. Could that same model be adapted uh, for uh, local information at a neighborhood level? And on our next panel, um, you're going to hear from uh, folks from the place-based Gates Family Foundation in Colorado, which responded to the crisis at the Denver Post um, as a foundation in engaging uh, journalists and the community on how to build new models for, for journalism. And the commission's uh, work in deliberations clearly helped inform uh, Knight's approach and strategy and our announcement um, last week where, uh, last week or, yes, last week. Um, it's all blending together, it's <laughs> all good. Um, last week that uh, Knight is increasing its, its commitment uh, to $300 million, we're doubling our commitment to journalism and to research um, of battling uh, misinformation and disinformation over the next five years. And many of the projects that we uh, funded uh, came out of discussions, such as Report for America, because as uh, Mizell said, it's critical that um, that we are all supporting, all of us as funders who care about our communities, putting more people on the ground. The ProPublica local reporting project, which, um, which is, is partnering, which is funding uh, reporters and journalists all on the ground in cities and towns um, across the country and providing those journalists and those newsrooms with the data journal journalism resources and investigative reporting um, expertise that ProPublica brings to all of its outstanding um, journalism. And other investments include um, the Solutions Journalism Network, which uh, we ha have just seen just such success in Philadelphia, in the Mountain West, uh, just across the country, just help change the conversation about um, 
beyond just reporting the problems, but also evidence-based reporting on what some solutions might be. That has turned out to be a really great example of, um, of how uh, journalists can engage with their communities around issues. I say something now that you mentioned ProPublica. That reminds me of an article I read there once. Um, I think it was September of last year. And I remember that article as I was thinking about this panel on Monday. It was a conversation between two women, reporters who had worked both in Spanish and English, as I have. And one of them made a comment that I thought was really, really smart, and I had never thought about it that way. And after I read it, I thought, it was one of the things that, of course. And she said, traditional outlets do their reporting top to bottom, meaning they get a report, a study, um, talk to somebody in a position of power, and then they go to the communities to get the quotes. <laughs> and Spanish language media go to the communities, are in the communities, they're embedded in the communities. They find out what's going on, and then they make the other calls, and then they find the studies, and they get the, and I thought, yes, of course, that's the difference. And, that, and I, I realized, I felt that imbalance in my own life as I went from the Miami Herald to the New York Times. But I didn't have the words, I didn't have the language to say that. I didn't know back in 1996 when I made that transition. Um, because even though I was working in the Miami Herald in English, I was in my community. But I didn't know when I made that transition what was happening. And I remember once going to, uh, an editor gave me a report of um, the dangers of mercury in uh, the Hispanic community. And I was told to find examples and to go do it. So it mostly they meant in uh, the Dominican community in Washington Heights. And I'd, I'd never been to Washington Heights. So I had just gotten to the New York Times. So I went to Washington Heights and began doing what I know to do, which is knocking on doors. And to my surprise, always I'm surprised when people open their doors and grateful, very grateful, <laughs> and humbled. Um, some people, I mean, people were nice, but community leaders were like, the New York Times here? Now, because you have a report? It was a long time ago. I think the New York Times has changed. But I was like, well, you know, I have to do this. My editor sent me. I got to do it. Can I actually add a, an, an analogous situation? Because I think this is really important for local journalism. Um, there, I had a, an amazing conversation with actually one of the USA Today Network editors who moved from running a, one of uh, the Gannett's local papers to headquarters. And he said something that I think is really wise, which is he said, you know, sometimes you might be based in Monroe, Louisiana, or um, rural Michigan, but he said, you know, if you wake up in the morning and turn on NPR and get in your car, or you wake up in the morning, you watch, you know, MSNBC, get in your car, listen to NPR, get to the newsroom, and, and see your other fellow graduates from Missouri School of Journalism, you're really not in your community. Right. And, and it's so important to understand that, that you know, wherever you are, you actually have to be embedded into that community. It's, it's, it's sometimes our journalists are more connected to the journalism, larger journalism community, yep. than they are to their local, uh, local uh, communities. And, and now you know why I refused to move to D.C. when you hired me at USA Today. <laughs> <laughs> My Zell lives. In Ohio. I live uh, right outside of Akron, Ohio. Yeah, there you go, there you go. And Charlie, what, what do you think needs to be done in terms of, or what advice would you have as we look to uh, support um, the rebuilding of local journalism? Yeah, by the way, I also live in flyover country in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, no, the, the extent of this problem is, is really dramatically highlighted in this, uh, in this report. And if you haven't seen Penny Abernathy's piece on, on the news deserts, it's however bad right you think it is, it's, it's, it's worse than you think it is. 
um, in part because it's, that documents the parts of the country where there are no local newspapers whatsoever. And then there are also the ghost newspapers, the ones that have been hollowed out, you know, stabs, the papers that used to have 400 uh, staffers that now have 40 staffers. Um, you know, really don't cover the local community in any way whatsoever. But if I could turn the focus just a little bit, because we're all focusing on journalism and the problems with journalism. You know, the whole point of this report was, of course, restoring faith in, in, uh, in democracy and the media, what was the whole title of it. But, so why do we want to rebuild trust in media? It's not an end in and of itself. It's, it's because of the role that media plays in civil society and democracy. I mean, truth is the oxygen of democracy. If you don't have that, nothing else works. So you need to have a, a credible functioning media, but then you also need something else. You actually need to have uh, an engaged citizenry that cares, that is knowledgeable. So, you know, as we sat over more than a year of deliberating like the misinformation and everything, um, everything that we recommend to deal with the misinformation, I agree with. However, I guess I'm a little cynical about our ability to stop that flow of misinformation. So the question is not, is, is then, well, how can we create an immune system in the public? Why are there so many gullible voters that believe the misinformation? I mean, that's part of the problem. And that's why we also address the concept of citizenship. You know, and Charlie Firestone came up with the concept of, you know, the sovereign citizen. Look, we, we don't teach civics anymore. We don't teach history anymore. We're having debates about the rule of law to a public that, that is completely not engaged. We see this in voting, in, in voting numbers. So we do address that as well, the, the, the audience for this misinformation, that you actually have to educate the public in a variety of ways. We have to do something to revitalize a citizenry that will then be receptive to what a trusted media will, will, will give them. Um, our luncheon speaker yesterday said something that is in, immensely important. That, that, I, that I think cannot be underestimated. And he quoted Hannah Arendt, who basically said um, something similar to what, when I was hosting the WNYC show, Indivisible, we had Gary Kasparov on the show, um, who's a former chess champion, world chess champion, Russian dissident. And I think he was channeling Hannah Arendt when he said, look, the point of all this misinformation and propaganda is not necessarily to get you to believe one thing or another. It's basically to attack your critical sensibility. It's to annihilate truth so that at the end of the day, people are so overwhelmed that they don't know who to believe anymore, and they therefore don't care. And so they tune out everything that we're doing. It's almost the introduction of doubt in civil society. Exactly. And, and, it, and, it, it's, and, and the fact is that our brains, as human beings, are not necessarily wired to find out what is true. You know, uh, you know maybe we are wired in order to confirm our bias to strengthen our, our ties to our tribes. And so the whole point of civil society is to push back against that, to make you get out of that. That maybe the default setting of people is to believe what they want to believe. And in the modern society, all you need to do is, you know, go on Twitter or turn on Fox News or turn on MSNBC and you will have all of your worldview confirmed. If you don't want to believe something, you will find something. So we are up against a much greater challenge. And so to, to put all the weight on the media, I think is, well, they deserve a lot of weight. There's no question about it. But we also need to recognize that we have a population that believes a lot of stuff that turns out to be bullshit. And most troubling, there's a l large part of the population that may know that it's not true and they may not care. So we have a really deep rebuilding process here.